Hey everyone, welcome to another video. I'm Mike B, your fellow fat fud and flannel, and I am going to be making a comment response video to the ASMR of loading military surplus rifles that actually is doing extremely well at the time of me making this video. I didn't expect it to take off that fast and that much at all, but I guess it did. You guys were right, all of you who suggested that. The video was very time consuming and tedious and Get to the point where it wasn't fun to make anymore, but it was worth it in the end when I put the whole thing together and was, God, I just literally drooled. And I'll leave it in there because I'm perfect, you know. Um, no, anyway. Um, so after I got to the end and was able to see it, and was like, okay, that might have been worth it for the few minutes of footage. And uh, a little little one that I'm not going to be talking about is, yes, I looped it once because when I didn't loop it on the first ASMR video that I made, people whined that it was too short. So I just decided to loop it once just so you can kind of you know, the whole point of ASMR is to just kind of sit back and relax and, you know, fall asleep to it. So, uh -huh, yeah, okay. There you go. So we'll get that one out of the way. That wasn't part of the list. I just kind of, you know, just so advanced in my thinking today. Just on top of shit. Um, so if you're new to the channel because of that video or because of whatever other reason, welcome. And if you haven't really watched any of my older videos, the, my personality will be coming through a little bit on this one. So you can see, decide if you like it or not. Uh, good luck. I hope you, uh, hope you don't get too butthurt or disturbed or angry or you know think I'm too big of a cringy douche etc etc I just encourage you to stick around because you just might learn something from these addressing of comments so the first one that was I mean we're talking the I, I picked six of them that I saw that were just non-stop people saying the same shit over and over again a lot of them were saying it some of them were asking it these are all actually questions so some of them were in statement form but they're actually a question and so whenever you release something on the internet and it actually gets more than a couple of views, you get what's called, uh, by Paul Harrell's kind of definition, a bunch of internet fake experts that come out and have to put in their two cents or ask dumb questions to try and prove that they know more than you, when really they don't know jack shit. Um, I don't know if, you know, there's fake experts or if there's just people that don't know, but it's the way they're saying these things with such confidence that makes me want to address all of these points. Now, nah, that wasn't a long enough intro. We'll get to it. First one. Dude, why didn't you give us the M1 ping when you loaded the M1? So, and followed by whatever redundant, typical, like generic COD fanboy statement about how the M1 ping is the greatest sound ever. Um, first of all, I made an entire fucking ASMR video on just the grand ping, so obviously didn't bother to check that out before you commented, so ha <laughs> ha, joke's on you. You probably realized that by now, but anyway, I got sick of answering this comment, so I'm just going to answer it here, so I don't have to do it anymore. Um, let's take a look at why I didn't do the M1 ping. I didn't unload any of the other firearms either, just letting you know, so why would I do that just for the M1? And why would I do it when it's still loaded? Check this out. So here's a little demonstration on what would have happened had I unloaded the M1 Garand. Oh dear god, he's going to load another live round. Yes, I had to ride the charging handle forward because if your M1 is working correctly and your clip is still tight enough, that will, when you push it down, the bolt will just kind of push the round a little bit forward and all the pressure from the clip and the action won't actually pull the bolt forward, so you gotta slap it, whatever. So that was another question, I'll just answer that. So here's what would have happened. Okay, so there's the one round. I'm gonna just let this clip fly out. Wow, that's a hell of a ping we've got there, isn't it? It wouldn't have pinged. It's still got rounds in the in the end block. Look at that. So even if I would have pulled it back, it wouldn't have made the ping. And I already made that other video completely. So that is why I did not give you the ping because I would have had to do another separate shot and just basically remake a clip when I just made an entire freaking video on it. So. Hopefully, that clears that question up. Now I'll move on to number two. On the LaBelle 1886-93 rifle, it has a tubular magazine that uses pointy bullets, which is a fun term that people use. You can tell that they really know what they're talking about. Uh, the correct word is a Spitzer bullet, or Spitzer. You know, I just wanted to be so correct and be really condescending with that first pronunciation, the original German pronunciation. Um, but yeah, the Spitzer bullet. Okay, the pointy bullet that you call it, the sharp one. Uh, you should never love that in a tubular magazine. You are correct on most every single tube-fed magazine besides the LaBelle 1886-93 using a specific kind of ammunition. Check this out. Welcome to Les Demonstrations. I know I butchered that. 
It's very intentional because I'm American. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, welcome. We're going to be talking about the 1886-93 and the 8x51 rimmed cartridge in this awesome rifle that so many of you had a problem with and you would not listen to me and go do your own research. So now I'm going to have to make an entire part of this video demonstrating it. Anyway, so tubular magazines in the 1880s were not a new thing. They had been around since the 1840s or 50 or 50s, sorry. And um, Spitzer bullets were a relatively new thing, but pointy bullets, as you call them, were really kind of not. So they figured out early on, like in the Henry and the, you know, um, the other rifles like the Spencer, or not the Spencer wasn't it, but like the Henry rifle, right? They, they used a round bullet or a wad cutter. So they wouldn't set off the primary because what happens is if you don't have, you know, you've just got a center fire cartridge and you've got a Spitzer bullet or a pointy bullet behind it, it's going to sit on that primer. And then if you have it all loaded and there's enough pressure on there, it'll set the primer in front of the whatever offsetting a chain reaction, blowing the gun up, possibly harming yourself and others. Now, by 18, the 1880s, you know, 30 years had passed since that technology was new. And the French came out with the first smokeless powder cartridge to be adopted by a military, the 8x51R. It's a very fat, tapered cartridge. Now, I'm pretty sure their engineers took that, that into consideration, right? So when you just assume that, you know, a rifle that was used by millions of troops around the world for almost, you know, a half century or more than a half century loaded with billions of rounds, you'd think that uh, you'd hear more about the guns blowing up from a tube-fed magazine using pointy bullets. But here's the thing. So for those of you that don't know about the magazine system, you can kind of see it right here. Um, so you load it in through the action like this. Here, I'll pull the bolt back. Down here is the tube. You can kind of see it. And you push the bullet in, and then that little detent holds it, and blah, blah, blah. So yes, they're going to be in a line. Now, they had thought of that, so they made, they took the design, which is really tapered. You can see that it's very tapered. It's so it's fat down here and it wall, or it's really skinny up there. So what they did is they put a rim in the back of the, or on the bottom of the head right here. You see that? So you saw on the other cartridges that that wasn't there. So what happens was the design of the bullet, because they're kind of oblong and weird shaped, even if you load it and it starts off on the primer, it's going to slide off into this rim and that's how it actually sits in the magazine, the eight round magazine. So they thought of that. I've loaded hundreds of rounds in through this thing. I know people who have also done the same, thousands if not, and it was designed that way for a reason and it works. They use Spitzer bullets basically the entire time. So it wasn't like they didn't take that into consideration. So you see that that's how it sits in the magazine with all that pressure on there. And even if it does go on the primer, it slides off from the design of the, the cartridge. So to all you internet experts out there that told me I was wrong and that you should never load, you can't load Spitzer bullets or Spitzer rounds into a tube magazine, there is an exception and that is this rifle. Don't do it to any other rifles. And also PPU does make um, non, they don't have that rim around there for the Bertier rifles. Don't use those in this magazine. That's all I'm going to say. Make sure it's got that extra rim on there if you're going to be loading that in an 1886-93. So Hopefully that explains that to all you people that keep telling me that I'm dumb and that it was going to blow up and it's super dangerous and you're all fucking paranoid because you don't know what you're talking about. All right, hopefully that clears it up. Let's move on. Three, this one was funny. Using live ammo. Okay, I don't know how, this came in many different forms. <laughs> I hope those aren't live rounds. I'm really nervous for you, brah. Oh God, really? Oh, it's just, you, He's just gonna have a negligent discharge. Oh god, just the way it just made me so nervous and cringy and he loaded those live rounds. Oh, slam fire! Just name your poison, a bunch of different forms. This one doesn't require a demonstration because I already did it on the video. So, basically, here's the thing. I do what I do based on my experience and my level of comfort and my, I don't know, environment and all that stuff. The environment that I was loading live rounds in involves me not putting my finger anywhere near the trigger. Yes, I was in my home. Yes, they were pointed in a safe direction. No, that's not just, you know, a window versus a wall. They were pointed in a direction where if they were to go off, that round would have done damage only to my wall and possibly some trees and some dirt. That is it. There were no houses. Nobody was walking where I'm at. I made sure of that. It was as safe as you can get. Now, do I recommend loading live rounds in your home? No, I don't recommend it. shit on this channel. I tell you what I do, I show you what I do, and I'm not a professional teacher, an instructor, or anything. 
But here's the thing. If you load a live round into a, into a rifle and it decides to go off, you might want to either scrap the rifle or get it checked by and repaired by a competent gunsmith because there's something wrong with it. These rifles are made to be chambered with live rounds and then placed on safe. I didn't place them all on safe uh, because that you know it's a step after you work the bolt on most of those. Um, but some of them were on safe. It's the nature of the beast. I wanted to demonstrate what they actually sound like loading live rounds in. That was the point. That was the mentality behind it. If you're nervous about that, you should learn more about guns, become more familiar with them, or just don't comment. It's that simple. It's okay. If I have a fucking accident, I will not just cut the video and, you know, it disappears forever. I will show you. I will admit that I fucked up. I will explain why, and you'll see that. I have not had an accident in 30 years so far, knock on wood. So I'll continue using my best judgment in doing what I want in my home with my rifles and not endangering anybody else. Your mileage may vary. I would not recommend doing that at home. Cool. Let's move on. The fourth one. I need better. You need better equipment, better mic, brah, better camera. Why is this sound so condensed, brah? Okay, first of all, the ASMR, if you haven't figured it out, is a joke. I don't make ASMR videos. It's a it's a mock of, like, the ASMR thing, because I think it's absolutely ridiculous, and it's a scam, but it's a popular scam, and everything that I think is a scam makes a hell of a lot more money than I'll ever make in my life. But it's just stupid. Like, good God, why would you want to listen to some chick, like, whisper in your, in your ear in your headphones and, and, like, make your... It makes my hair stand up on end, not in a good way. I don't know, it's just a bunch of freaking, you know... Hey, commandos, virgins, you know, just, oh, this is the closest I'm ever going to get to a, to a vagina. But that's my opinion. I, I might be wrong, you know. But no, it's just like, I don't like ASMR. I think it's stupid. I think it's a waste of time. And, um, but hey, that's my opinion. So I decided to kind of mock it and also make some videos that I thought would be cool. It's unique. I haven't seen them done before. So I figured I'd make them. It was a joke. Um, but on a serious note, if you want to help me get better equipment, because I'm using an iPhone 8 right now, which I'm fine with. But if you really want better equipment, better microphones and all that stuff... There's really cool ways to do that. You can become a patron, which the link to that is in the description, or a channel member on YouTube. Both ways financially support me so I can get cooler stuff, better equipment to make better videos and all that stuff. Get more things to make uh, you know, historical videos on, historical content, firearms related content, helmets, gear, all that stuff, reviews, camouflage tests, ballistic tests, all that stuff. So yeah, that's the solution if you uh, want me to get better equipment. If not, there's really no need to comment because it doesn't matter. I'm, it's, it's a joke and... I'm fine with what I've got right now, and so are most of my viewers. All right, that's done. Five. Should have gone slower on the cycling. Uh, no, I shouldn't have. I was demonstrating like a combat reload speed. If somebody becomes proficient enough, I'm not saying I'm proficient. I'm saying I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. I've got experience just you know out at the range and stuff, and a lot with bolt action rifles. I've been doing them, doing them quite consistently for about ten years now. It's not that long, but I've gotten the feel the feel for a bunch of different kinds of. Um, clips and loading systems and all that stuff if you haven't noticed. Uh, that being said, there were a lot of outtakes, and if you become a Patreon supporter or a channel member, you can see those bloopers from the actual video, and I did fuck up quite a bit. Um, not as much as I actually got good footage, but there were a lot of mistakes because I wanted to make them decent for the video. Anyway, so those reload speeds are not actually that quick. You can do that. All you have to do is practice, right? Uh, some of the Enfield fanboys are like, Oh, you did it wrong, mate. You got to, you got to put your fingers the certain way and angle the clips, and it's very fast and very fluid. It's like, I don't care. I'm not a pro. But a lot of people seem to think I was a pro. You can get just as good as that. Maybe I'll do some videos on how I got experience doing that and all that stuff, doing the thumb motion. And no, my thumb wasn't that chewed up after it because I split it up into filming over several days. <gasps> another, another bonus comment answered. Um, all right, number six, all right? Why do some clip clips fall out and some need to be removed? Are you fucking kidding me? Actually, this is a really good question. I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, I think some of the designs are just made that way. I know the Mauser actions, you can see you're just supposed to ride the bolt home and it does that. Uh, the, the 1903 Turkish model, I don't know why that one. It's really hard. I, you can slam the bolt forward or ride it home, but the angle I was shooting at and everything, uh, the, shooting the video at... It would, it would have been really hard for me. Um, the Mosin Nagant, I mean, theoretically, you could slam, you could try to slam a lot of these forward and maybe it'll wiggle itself out or jar itself out. But some of the rifles I've learned that it's not worth taking that risk for that extra half second and it's easier to just 
take that split second, you know, like a quarter second instead of a half second, move it out of the way, and then push the bolt forward. I actually don't know the answer to that, why they were like that. I know some of the Russian, the Mosin Nagant fanboys are like, oh, you know, he loaded that wrong and all that stuff. And, and you know, it, would, it will fall out. Well, I've never had experience with any military clips, Polish, Hungarian, Bulgarian, uh, Soviet clips, or Imperial Russian clips. I've never had one that actually ejects from any platform of the Mosin Nagant rifle. So your mileage may vary. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Um, also, just to kind of follow up with that, you can load a Mosin Nagant that smoothly too. You just have to get military clips, which are really expensive nowadays. Those Chinese ones that cut your fingers, they're not going to be able to let you load that quick. You also have to learn about rim lock, make sure your interrupter is working, on your, especially in your Refurb 9130, all that stuff. Maybe I'll make a video on how to load the Mosin Nagant more smoothly. Again, I'm not the fastest at that. Look at Gun Geek's channel. I don't know if you guys know who he is. He's some Canadian weirdo up north that actually helped me kind of get my channel going, and we had a pretty fun time back in 2013 and 14. Gun Geek is really good. He's from Canada, and he is like the pro at reloading the Mosin Nagant. So shout out to Gun Geek if you're still watching, you creepy, weird little dude. But anyway, so I think I'll wrap this video up. I already did the Patreon shtick. So yeah, that's just kind of my response. If you made it this far, um, I don't know what you can comment. Why don't you just say I made it this far? Flannel. How about that? So yeah, I figured I'd just kind of clear that up. Oh, I'm sorry this video ran so long. I just had to cover these because I'm just getting sick of answering 50 billion of these. So all right. anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think. And again, thank you so much for all my new subscribers, my previous subscribers, past and present, uh, Patreon supporters and all that stuff. Thank you everybody that's helped me make it this far. I'm almost to 100,000. This is going to be really cool. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of ranting at this point, which is another thing, another perk you get with me. Anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. I don't know who else to thank. And we'll see you on the next video.